Artificial intelligence uh, means many things to many people. Uh, I'm going to talk about it not from a technology point of view, not from a futurist science fiction point of view, but from a point of view of how it impacts society today. Today, between now and 2025, and especially 2025 to 2030, the world is undergoing a revolution as dramatic as the Industrial Revolution was. And just like the Industrial Revolution 200 years ago created haves and have-nots, allowed England and France to colonize other countries like India and many other parts of the world. Similarly, this AI revolution is going to create new haves and new have-nots. It is unstoppable. The question is not whether it is good or bad, because that depends on who uses it and with what intentions. The question rather is, what do we get out of it? What should we do? What should be our policymakers' you know, responsibility? So my focus is on AI, ethics and responsibility, not whether we should do it or not and things like that, because it's going to happen anyway. The world today is held in a delicate equilibrium. Many, many balances among individuals. There are different balances among different kinds of individuals working with each other. There are balances between employer and employee, between different regions of a country and among different countries. So these balances will be disrupted and fall apart when new technology gives force to some people more than others. The new technology gives is a weapon for some more than others. It is a productivity tool for some over others. It gives better investments to some industries, not to other industries. So what happens is if it's like in a tug of war, imagine the teams are balanced, but somebody feeds some, uh, some uh, nutrition and one team is able to use the nutrition better. Then the, the other team is not able to use it. It's available, but they can't use it. Then this equilibrium will fall apart. There will be a disequilibrium. The balance will fall apart. It will collapse. So the, the uh, effect of uh, artificial intelligence today is being felt in, is being felt in th things like new industries where new, all new kinds of opportunities are coming. Old industries are dying and this is going to accelerate rapidly. Many people ask me, well, sir, I don't know, I don't know artificial intelligence. I don't see it. Here's an important point. It's not always visible like the tip of the iceberg. A little part is visible, a large part of AI is under the surface. And what is under the surface, you need to know, because that could be your friend, that could be dangerous. So I tell them something like this. When you open your smartphone with a thumbprint, okay, that's AI. Because in the old days, fingerprints were recognized by human beings. You had to calculate every fingerprint to see if this fingerprint matches, is this, who is this guy? But now AI does it very quickly. When you use facial recognition, to open your smartphone, you're using AI. When you do speech recognition, it understands what you are saying. It understands the words. It can automatically type when you're typing, when you're talking to Siri or Alexa or any of these voice systems. You know, speech recognition, voice recognition is AI. These bots are AI. Bots are very rudimentary, simple AI, but they're becoming very smart. So there's something called natural language processing, which understands the meaning of what you're saying. It understands what your sentiment is. Are you saying a happy person? Are you unhappy? Are you fearful? Are you angry? You know, what, what is your sentiment? It can measure the sentiment of a community. So if there's a farmer riot going on, it can read the emails and the messages that they are sending, and it can look at what is the sentiment of these people compared to what it was yesterday. What about those among them who are leaders? Are they angry or are they not less angry? What about this new policy that somebody announced or a new news item that came? What was the impact on the sentiments of these people? So it's able to evaluate all that. So not only it's able to understand the sentiments by recognizing text and, and using natural language, but increasingly facial recognition systems are also looking from your face. They're telling your sentiments. What kind of mood are you in? What happened when a certain message was sent to you? What happened? What was your reaction? It's able to tell that. Now, these sentiment analysis and the mood analysis and understanding what people are saying is not only at the level of an individual, but could be a whole community. Like what are the, what are the, some community X feeling about this news item? 
what are people in Bangalore feeling about it versus people in the north feeling about it? How are the Chinese reacting versus somebody else reacting? So this kind of a thing being automated is of course immensely powerful. I have divided the battlegrounds, I call them battlegrounds, that AI is going to create into three levels, physical level, psychological, emotional level, and spiritual level. So let's go through them. At the physical level, we're talking about jobs, economy, things of that sort, uh, internal to a country. So uh, who will be the winners and losers in the new job market? Because there will be a lot of losers and there will be a lot of winners. And you should know that. They will not only as, as individuals, but also as industries, also as regions. Maybe Karnataka will come out ahead with AI and maybe Bihar, a lot of industries, a lot of jobs will be lost. These are the reasons why I feel that all the current studies and reports that are talking about AI, especially in developing countries like India, have a simple problem. They're written from the corporate point of view and not from the bottom up point of view. They're not written from the point of view of the labor or the villages or the migrant workers who will be adversely affected. They're written from the point of view of, you know, venture capitalists and investors in Mumbai and big cities like that and uh, entrepreneurs and AI type tech people in Bangalore. So my concern is that these reports, whether I don't want to name uh, companies, but whether it is World Economic Forum or various type of corporate, corporate people, those corporate entities are serving big business. They typically go to the large MNCs and ask them, you know, your use of AI and how much, how good it will be and what good we will do and all that. And so it gives you a good PR from their point of view. And unfortunately, government agencies mirror that and echo that. And I'm not satisfied with it. I have yet to see an AI report which went to state by state because each state will have a different impact. Please note, each state will have a different impact. Like the water situation is different for different states. You cannot just have one policy. Uh, similarly, AI will affect different states differently because they have different kind of industries. Also, I would like them to go to NGOs that represent the, the, the lowest strata of society. The l bottom 500 million people in India, the bottom 500 million people in Africa and so on are the ones most vulnerable and they don't have a seat at the table. I don't see their representatives, their voices being considered. So these are some of the concerns regarding the physical level of how it's going to affect us. The other part of the physical impact is going to be weapons. Suddenly you will find that you are already finding that there are drones with all kinds of capabilities better than piloted, hum piloted planes. And robotic soldiers, they can go on high altitude, they don't fall sick, they don't need medicines, they don't need food, uh, they don't need special clothing. And if one of them fails, they fail, doesn't matter, you can make lots of them. Also, pilotless or driverless uh, submarines, drones that are underwater. So there's new warfare, both at the level of actual machines that are going to do the fighting, replacing human beings, also at the level of surveillance, like unparalleled surveillance of every little thing going on, hacking other countries and doing it. And also at the level of the, 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 the place where, you know, the war room from where you run, the generals are sitting and running all the stuff. That is also AI driven. So the, the, at the physical level, both inside a country and outside the borders, uh, you know, AI is changing the whole uh, game. The second level, after having talked about the physical, the second level is your psychology and your emotions. All social media is driven by algorithms. Please note, social media, the people who own it and drive it, they don't have, you know, one lakh people sitting there answering your questions and deciding which one to block and what you said and all of that. It is all driven by algorithms and all algorithms are driven by AI. So AI controls the algorithms which control the social media. Now, what is happening increasingly is that the idea of human agency, my, my freedom to decide for myself is being taken over more and more because we are influenced by what people will think, what will get me retweets, what will get me likes. Will this TEDx, uh, TEDx talk succeed? How many people are going to like it? What should I say in order to become more popular? Things of that sort. The idea of truth used to be with with the, uh, the adhikar or the, uh, or the authorities used to be local in, in every village in the world, or it used to be parents, teachers, 
uh, used to be the text, the sacred text of a tradition. Now it's your social media controlled from somewhere else in the world. It is deciding what is true. Your these uh, these digital you know encyclopedias. You're talking to uh, a, a, a digital assistant, whether it is Siri or whether it is whatever it is, uh, you know Alexa or any of the other ones, uh, uh, you know, or or you're going and doing a search. The authorities that are telling you what is true and what is false are not the traditional authorities. So this is also changing a whole. Uh, it's creating a whole problem uh, in the in the in the local uh, local sense that uh, your your local authorities are no longer the ones in power and the authorities that are sitting somewhere else in the world from a different culture from a different civilization they are taking over more and more control over your lives now as machines are getting smarter people are getting dumber please note as machines are getting smarter people are getting dumber because we are outsourcing the knowledge to the, the authorities in the, the that are driving the ai so the system said this sir must be true uh, more likes came to this particular point of view must be true so the the idea of what is true is also changing it, it and and lot of people are saying you know i don't need to learn why do i need to learn so much sir because uh, this uh, search will tell me whenever i need to know google devta will tell me google google uncle will tell me <laughs> or google uh, you know big boss will tell me or i look up to this place and they will tell me why do i need to know anything and soon these augmented reality goggles uh, will also tell me you know where to go on my vacation and who to marry who to go on a date what kind of food i want uh, what uh, fashion is good for me so the the psychological intervention is becoming more and more detailed into our lives and we are going on autopilot autopilot uh, you know when they question uh, uh, people at different generations what is what do you think of all this automation taking over your life it's very interesting people of my generation only 10% say it's okay I, or 90% say i want to be in control then the next generation you know people in their 50s 40s also are like 10 15% are okay with all this giving up the the agency if you keep coming down in age below the age of 20 by the those are people born after the year 2000 new millennium those people generally youth many of you watching those are people who are saying i have no problem if uh, if the system tells me what food to eat it also puts it in my fridge for me it tells me what i should do where i should go what, you know in other words in other words i i I'm, i'm living on autopilot it'll run the show run my life for me now this is a trend which has many advantages because you have more free time and, and the system will run your life for you but what if i tell you that the system which is running your life is being controlled from a foreign country is not even your vested interest and this system is manipulating because it knows your psychology better than you know yourself it knows whenever you tweet to click something it know like records what you click what you like how to make you angry how to make you sad how to make one group fight another group so breaking india forces more power to will come to them how to uh, make you vote for this guy or as opposed to that guy how to convert you from one faith x to another faith y all of that power you're giving over because the the systems are hacking your mind so this is leading to short attention spans very short attention spans so now algorithms want to grab your attention because that's for sale if i if this algorithm can grab a lot of people's attention and move them in a certain direction i can sell it to a lot of advertisers and make a lot of money guess how these new people who are worth 100 billion dollars how they made their money and the american companies with a market cap of trillion dollars how did they become so rich in the past 20 years their services are free they're selling you giving you free G- mail free search free friends you can upload your pictures you can do all kinds of things how, how come the people who are giving away the services free are the richest people and they have become rich by offering these services they were not rich before how is that possible you should think about it it's possible because this knowledge they have over you and the influence they have over you by making you trust them and go on autopilot this can be solved this is the new advertising this is the new uh, you know the lobbying political lobbying religious conversion lobbying people of one country buying these kind of uh, algorithms and the power to go and influence other countries 
So India is for sale in that sense because uh, foreign countries have bought off these rights and these accesses. And the sad thing is that in India, we have some of the largest AI population in terms of software people, but we are not developing patents for India. The, so the, the, the talent in India is, use, is either going overseas and working for foreign companies and giving them the patents and then intellectual property. Or if they are staying in India, they are working for the foreign subsidiaries of these Indian companies. If they are working for an Indian enterprise, they are usually, they are usually using foreign algorithms, foreign technology, foreign licenses and making it better by uh, submitting data to them, we are making those algorithms better, which other people control. So there is a question of sovereignty. There is a question of India's sovereignty and the sovereignty of uh, developing countries. Is that being eroded and is that being lost? Yes, a few billionaires are making, being made. They are making a lot of money because they'll hire you for X, your brains for X dollars a year, and they'll hire, rent it out to somebody for three times, four times and make a lot of money. So the middlemen, who are taking the brains of young Indians and selling them somewhere are making tons of money. But what about the people themselves? How are they really different from, say, the labor that comes from a, that comes from a, a village and they work on a construction site in, 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 in Delhi? How is it really different? So this is a, this is a problem that uh, uh, requires more people to participate in the game, more people to participate as uh, uh, you know, policy makers. Uh, you need NGOs, you need village representatives, you need people from all the different states, uh, you need new kinds of social scientists who are who are educated in AI. Right now, it's only the technocrats who understand it from a technology point of view, and it's the big business and the investors, the corporate people who are using it, and a few government policymakers who may not be all that well informed. So my, my plea to you, the young people, is that you got to get involved, uh, not just be happy as consumers of AI, but you should be challenging the producers of AI because it's your world. And if, if somebody says, what right do you have? You should say, look, in, in climate change, every per person on the planet has a right because it's going to affect all of us. It's not just the person who's uh, the company with the factory that's creating, a, creating something. It is not just uh, for them to worry about. We, the consumers, have to worry about it. So now climate change, because of the last 30, 40 years of campaigning, and a lot of people doing in climate change what I'm now doing in AI. AI is where climate change was 30, 40 years ago in terms of uh, public awareness. So a lot of people work very hard all over the world. They got a lot of flack for it. They were first made fun of. They were told you a conspiracy theory. All of that happened way back. Okay, because of that, today the whole world is alert to qu quant uh, qu uh, climate change. It is being taught in schools, it is being discussed in the public media, and there is no country in the world where the young people are not concerned about climate change. I want to do the exact same thing for AI, because AI is another disruptor. It can be a great friend if we know how to do it properly, and it can, be, it can actually be a, a devastating force if we don't know how to do it properly. And like the tip of the iceberg, what you see is only part of the story. Thank you very much.